The Bombshell, Adam's Report. Martin North, John Adams, in the interest of the people. Hello, John. Hello, sir. So it's hit the fan. It, it is. So today is, uh, today is D-Day in our series on financial crime. So um, we just don't talk about uh, these issues, Martin. We actually take action. <laughs> so, so last week in part four, we'd spoken about um, how I was working on an independent report about ASIC's performance using ASIC's own numbers. Well, the reason why it's been just over a week since we've done the last show is, is that uh, particularly over the long weekend, I was burning them in the oil, finalizing the report, uh, checking every uh, number, every uh, calculation that we that I used, every source, uh, you know, looking at every sentence, uh, just because I, I know what's going to happen when you attack the establishment. If you make a mistake, they are going to come back with vengeance a thousand times harder. So, so that's why uh, I've been locked away for a week getting the, everything ready. But today is the day that the Adams report into ASIC has been officially released. Um, uh, and we have had some very positive media coverage from both news.com.au as well as the ABC. So uh, we're going to get into that. Um, but I do want to sort of underscore how what has happened over the last week, just so people can understand um, how we've been able to, in effect, box ASIC in. Um, and even though ASIC has gone on the record today saying that they, they, they dispute my numbers, I mean, it's a dispute about the calcul how I calculated the numbers, not the actual data. But, but basically, on Monday, Martin, I issued my report uh, to the media under embargo for three days. I gave them a 234 page file. These are all the relevant pages from all the annual reports and all the other documents I uh, used in my report. And I gave them my uh, spreadsheet, where, which has all the data and has all the calculations. And I said to the media, um, the embargo was lifted at 12 a.m. Thursday. So it was, uh, so we're about, what are we now? About two o'clock in the afternoon. Yep. So about 14 hours ago, I said, the embargo is lifted. You can then report about it. But I said to 20 media organizations across the country, I'm giving you the opportunity to, to fully vet the report. Um, I'm being 100% transparent. This is the 71 page Adams report. This is all the material. You can check every number. Uh, I've gone through it meticulously myself. I stand by the analysis. Um, uh, I think I'm on very solid ground here. And so in that process, a number of media, organ media organizations did uh, uh, come back. Uh, on Tuesday, I was interviewed uh, on the uh, in a, a via Zoom call with the ABC, and that should be on tonight vis-a-vis uh, -vis the business uh, program that they have. Uh, News.com called me and, and, and interrogated me for about an hour, but I, no one actually said... I found a mistake, um, uh, and obviously, as we've discussed on a previous occasion, I did meet senior officials at ASIC on the 8th of September, and they did see the draft report uh, where the numbers were the numbers, um, and there was no discussion about there was any factual errors. So I think we're on fairly solid ground now. Um, and so, uh, obviously, the other key aspect is is that when you're about to put your reputation on the line on the national stage, as I have done today, you want to ensure that you have uh, some allies lined up. And so uh, the great thing about today is that, um, and, and so why don't we just show the ABC online piece, we'll, we'll put that up on the screen. Um, but uh, the great thing about today, Martin, was that we had two senators, Senator Pratt from uh, Labor, she's a Western Australian senator, and Senator Bragg, uh, who's a liberal from New South Wales, both coming out today in the media, supporting the Adams report, supporting the call for an inquiry, both uh, and, and, and you know, both said they have concerns with ASIC. And I, this is something I, we've, I've said in the last few shows on this channel, there is a universal concern in Parliament, whether from the far left to the far right, about ASIC. Um, and so the fact that we're, we've, we've, hit, we, we've hit the ground running um, by not only launching the report, not only getting a national media attention, but we have members of parliament 
particularly relevant to the one of the committees that I've been focused on, saying there is a problem. Adams Adams is onto something. Adams is not, is not the crazy conspiracy theorist that some may allege, um, <laughs> and that there is a need to get on top of this issue because financial crime is a problem in this country. Yeah, well, it's worth underscoring, I think, two things, John. The first is it's ASIC's data that you've based all your analysis off, right? That's correct. So there's obviously room for interpretation around the data, but their data is their data. Precisely. Right? And secondly, this whole concept of cross-party support, it's almost unheard of. It's amazing. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, that, 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 that is correct. Um, but, but in this type of issue, and this is something we've unscored in this series of financial crime, when something goes wrong, the politicians hear it from, from in terms of all quarters. Uh, and particularly when something does go wrong and people know who has done the wrong thing, um, and they go to the regulator and then nothing happens. Well, um, those uh, case studies get presented to all f types of politicians. Mm. And, and, you know, to be honest, there's no partisan bent with money. Money is money. And when you lose it, people get really upset. Yeah, and it's also worth noting that it was an independent professional body who also came out and said, yay. Indeed, indeed. So, so yeah, so if we can go um, to slide one. So here's a quote directly from the ABC uh, story this morning. And so this is this is a quote coming from the Australasian Centre for Corporate Responsibilities. So, so they say that their decision to commence the court proceedings itself rather than refer the matter to ASIC was in part informed by ASIC's anemic performance uh, record to date. So, so again, so um, the great thing about this ABC uh, piece this morning by Dan Ziffer, uh, Martin, is that not only did he, was he able to bring politicians from either side saying Adams is onto something, mm. they found uh, a professional body who's also saying we don't trust ASIC to actually um, deal with reports of alleged misconduct. So because they are so poor at their job, we had to go to court ourselves and take on the cost. Um, um, and, and, and obviously, um, you know, that that is obviously an indictment in and of itself. So so again, sometimes people may think, well, who is this guy, John Adams from Wollongong, to call for a public inquiry? Who is he to just issue his own reports and just cause all this havoc? But but at least when I mean, part of the reason why was the the ABC News dot com were were willing to run the story is because they are hearing from m many many people across the community that there is a problem here and so uh what i was able to do was to crystallize um that the problem is getting worse um in a methodical way and that obviously was music to the ears of some of these journalists who have been uh, reporting about ASIC for the last few years mm, that's worth saying john isn't it that uh, we've had quite a few people you know share stories off the record as it were of their run-ins with ASIC or inability to get things done by ASIC. So it is a widespread problem. It's clearly quite deeply spread across the Australian uh, psyche and across the Australian economy. And there are many individual examples. Absolutely, absolutely. And, 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 and just to, to, to underscore what we were saying in part three about the package. Mm. So I pulled it off, but, but the question is, um, should I be the exception of the rule? Um, and, and I definitely think I should be the, the exception because the mum and dad investor really, really can't put the evidence together and do the legal analysis to get ASIC um, interested in a particular case. No, well, the fact is not many people can spend nine months and what many thousands of dollars to write this massive binder and chuck it into ASIC and get them to react. Most people just can't do that. And that's the problem. Exactly, exactly. Now, if we turn our attention to the news.com.au article, Martin, so let's put that on, on the screen. And, and again, um, uh, so, so, so Alex uh, Turner-Cohen uh, wrote a very devastating piece about ASIC uh, that's not going to make us any friends on Market Street in Sydney. <laughs> um, so, and obviously Market Street is where ASIC's headquarters are. Um, but, but, but there was also, in this case, so news.com.au have been talking to liquidators quite consistently over the last little while. And, and there's all these allegations about Ill illegal financing operations. So this is where a company will go off and set up a new company and transfer all the assets so that I, so, and, so that I don't have to pay the liabilities. And they just allow that existing corporate structure to just um, go into bankruptcy or insolvency. And then those 
uh, creditors who are who are owed money they they basically um, they they don't end up with any form of payment. So so that type of practice is illegal, and yet um, uh, it's it's happening in in, in Australia quite quite frequently. And yet, there doesn't seem to be the enforcement of the law. So, so here's a particular quote. Let's put slide two on the screen. Um, so, so this comes from uh, quote the Australian Restructuring Insolvency and Turnaround Association CEO John Winter told News.com that the laws in place for corporate misconduct act as a good deterrent, but the problem was they were never being used. Mm. So, so again, so um, how do you enforce the law? You must, uh, and, and, and again, so uh, the first thing you must do is you must investigate. So now, depending on the investigation, depending on the evidence, depending on the nature of the case, um, whether they go to court or not go to court, that, that is a separate conversation for a separate day. But the issue of the Adams report that I've tried to highlight is, is that at, it, on ASICSO numbers, their appetite to investigate has diminished and, and there can be no argument that they are serious about enforcing the law now um part of why i think this report is devastating is because on the 23rd of august chairman longo gave a speech to cedar in which he said asics appetite to take on serious matters has not diminished mm -hmm. well the, the the fact is their numbers say it has sure. diminished yep. um and, and so we we have a, a regulator that's good at spin, that, that's good at trying to project an image, and yet the known numbers, their own numbers are saying something different. And it just so happens, to the best of my knowledge, no one actually bothered to go through 10 years of, of their annual reports to figure out what the trend is until I did it. And, and now we've been able to craft a very data-driven cogent story that is really going to give politicians a wake-up call to say, well, yes, we had the Royal Commission, we've had these inquiries, we've had these reviews, but pol public policy is not getting done um, in, in the financial system and that something new has to be um, uh, so something... We, we need, we need a, a circuit breaker. Now, I think it is an inquiry, uh, but not just an, an inquiry for the sake of having an inquiry, an inquiry of getting to the root cause of what's going on. And then obviously for the parliamentarians to be you know, very serious um, about how to fix it. And if that means heads must roll, Martin, well, then heads must roll. But, but I, I, and I've given some off-the-record comments to some senators about where, what I think has to be done. But... Uh, but I've said to them, if you just have an inquiry for the sake of having an inquiry, well, these problems are just going to continue to fester and you're not actually going to improve uh, outcomes in this country. Mm. Uh, again, it's worth just underscoring, isn't it, John, that the um, you know, financial inquiry into the banking system that was done a few years ago revealed a lot of stuff, but almost nothing changed off the back of it. And so there's a lot of scepticism. Even royal commissions, you know, do they really make a difference? Will they actually change anything? And that's really the critical thing. So however this is progressed, my question, I guess, to everybody, including yourself, is what can we do to make sure this time things really do improve rather than you just go through the workings of an inquiry but nothing changes at the back of it? Well, I mean, the thing is, is that so, so there are things beyond today's report that I'm working on that I'm not at liberty to say. Um, but, 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 but ultimately, Martin, it is, it, it is up to the government of the day. So mm. it is Albanese, it is the Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, it is the Assistant Treasurer, Stephen Jones. They're the three that have to be committed to change. And even if the parliament, even if there is a, a parliamentary inquiry which has a, a raft of recommendations, uh, they have to be implemented uh, with the people who are serious about making those uh, recommendations stick. Um, and so uh, whether it is just about politicians uh, uh, being more serious, because I don't think Morrison or Frydenberg were particularly serious in the last government. Mm -hmm. So is it, is it, there needs to be a different tone from cabinet. It doesn't, do we need to have a new chair and new commissioners? Or is it that some of these day-to-day -day executive managers that have been there for 20 years, some of those people need to move on and we get new people into ASIC? I mean, these are the questions that, uh, you know, are, are beyond my uh, scope and powers. But, but obviously, uh, as I've said to parliament, parliamentarians, you pass the laws 
as the job is to enforce the laws you pass. Um, and if they're not doing it, it's your responsibility to ensure that whatever problems exist in ASIC have to be fixed. Absolutely. And presumably ASIC will be in front of Parliament sometime quite soon anyway in the normal course of business. Oh, well, yes, yes. F- f- funny you should mention that. Um, as I was uh, going through uh, the various uh, websites, uh, uh, web pages of, of Parliament's uh, web, uh, website, uh, ASIC is before the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Economics next week. So whether there will be questions on this specific issue or not, we'll have to see. Uh, but, but, but again, I, I'm very confident that the report will stand on, on its own merits. It, the data is the data. The calculations, I think, are fairly um, conservative and solid about the, how I've gone through the methodology. Um, and, 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 and there is a worsening story at ASIC that needs to be addressed. And, and funny enough, Martin, is, is that, and, I, and this is something I didn't anticipate, is that uh, today uh, on national TV, uh, Dan Ziffer, who uh, interviewed me a couple of days ago, spoke for about six minutes about, um, uh, about my report um, and about ASIC's response. And obviously, uh, where, where will this go for? So how about we play that for the audience? An economist claims corporate watchdog ASIC is only investigating a tiny proportion of complaints it receives. John Adams was an advisor to Liberal Senator Arthur Sinodinos and says the percentage of complaints that are investigated is less than 1%. ASIC disputes that figure. Joining me now is business reporter Dan Ziffer. Dan, g'day. So first off, explain for us exactly what ASIC does uh, and how many complaints they receive and what they do about it. So ASIC is the conduct regulator for Australian business. They're meant to keep everyone on the straight and narrow. They're called the Australian Securities and Investments Commission. So essentially, if you're a registered company or a listed company in Australia, you are under their remit. They look after you, they write, they run the corporate laws. Now, they receive around 10,000 complaints in an average year. And they say that about 35% of them are kind of investigated further. Many of them uh, lack evidence or they're not in the correct jurisdiction. Some of them are resolved with, say, a letter warning the company or further action. This analysis that has come from economist John Adams takes in a much broader remit of reports to ASIC. It takes in things like self-confessed breach reports from companies where companies say themselves that they've broken the law, uh, liquidators reports, reports from people who have financial services licenses. And what that does, that creates a much larger number of complaints. And when you divide that by the amount that actually go through to a full investigation where ASIC really undertakes to work out whether something has gone wrong, you're looking at less than 1%. That obviously has a big impact because investigations and prosecutions have a real deterrent effect. It's not just that they punish the person that has done something wrong, they deter other people from doing the wrong thing. So it's fine to have laws, but without enforcement of them, without investigation of them, and without prosecution of cases in particular industries, there is essentially a magnetic effect where more people realise there's less of a problem with breaking these laws and there's more of an inducement to do it. So go into a bit more detail for us on what this analysis shows. So this analysis shows that if you include all of the reports, not just the around 10,000 that come from the public every year, but also from uh, self-confession, breach reports, from liquidators, auditors, and other people who hold financial services licenses, once you divide that by the number of actual investigations, actual things that go on to be investigated, you're looking at from complaints down to investigations, less than 1%. Now, ASIC uses a different methodology. They basically say they have an assessment process and that what Mr. Adams is talking about is a full active investigation that might end in the prosecution. So either way, what you are seeing is that there are vastly more complaints than ASIC does take to full investigation. Uh, And there's a reason for that. It's really complicated and they have, in some ways, a very difficult case to prove. Now, one of the most recent examples was that ASIC dropped action 
against 10 unnamed senior executives and board members of Crown Resorts. From watching this program, you'd know in the past few years, a huge swirl of problems of law breaking and allegations of criminal and breaches of civil law in various inquiries and royal commissions. But ASIC didn't progress with an investigation into 10 unnamed uh, senior executives and board members, basically because they didn't think they would be successful at prosecution. ASIC is currently investigating the STAR and they're not updating that investigation, but they have been looking at them for six months. But to give you a sense of how difficult it is, John Adams, the economist who has done this analysis, did successfully submit a complaint to ASIC about a financial issue. It is being investigated. But he's an economist and the complaint was 600 pages long. <laughs> right. That's simply not something most consumers can do if they get into trouble with the business. And so ASIC has lost its top leadership in recent years. What, what's happening, been happening at that top level? Uh, it's been messy, would be the uh, kindest thing you could say. ASIC was really exposed, along with a lot of other Australian regulators in the Banking Royal Commission, as being cowed and unable to really take on large institutions. In one excruciating example, ASIC was actually emailing words and text to uh, a bank about a press release that they were going to put out about something the bank had done wrong. And they were seeking approval from the bank about the press release they were gonna put out. You know, it was a really weird and terrible state of affairs. They since muscled up, promised to do better, and basically said rather than doing cozy deals, they would essentially ask themselves why not litigate. But in recent years, their chair, James Shipton, their deputy chair, Daniel Crennan, uh, both left their jobs uh, due to complications around their expenses. There's no indication either of those men did anything wrong, but an inquiry was going on about how they were paid. They didn't want it to drag out, so they left. Subsequently, we had the COVID pandemic and the government of the time decided that it didn't want an aggressive regulator when we're trying to get the economy back on track. So it forced ASIC to essentially drop that why not litigate stance and to take a more conciliatory approach to business. So huge turnover at the top for ASIC, always a vexed space with how they choose to take on particular issues and choose to leave others alone. Yeah, that's pretty powerful, John, isn't it? And uh, good old Zan, he's done, I think, a quite a good job there as to actually uh, tell the story. Yes, yes. The thing is, is that, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, the, the whole area of, of financial regulation, Martin, and financial crime and in terms of what goes wrong, um, you know, uh, you know uh, a lot of people have not had, an, had a serious adverse uh, situation where they've lost their life savings. But, but, but when it does happen, um, it, it is, as we've said in previous uh, parts of this series, it has huge consequences. And then you would hope that those who have ripped you off and taken your money, uh, they, they are brought to justice. And obviously that has not happened. And, and, and now, one of the things I can reveal is that not only have we released the report, um, I've written to th about 30 members of parliament um, uh, uh, over three committees, but also I've written to the Treasurer, the Assistant Treasurer, the Shadow Treasurer, and the Shadow Assistant Treasurer. And in, in all of these letters, I referred back to this four corner story that we've played in multiple aspects. Because when a Chief Financial Officer is on national TV saying, I was part of a fraud, we ripped people off, we stole their money, I went to the government to give them all the evidence that they required, not a phone call, not an email, that's not a country I want to live in. And I don't care what ASIC's excuse about the Wolf of Woi Woi is, that can never, that should never happen again, where a whistleblower is completely ignored. And that, uh, because here's the thing, part of ASIC's defense is that it's hard to get the evidence. It's hard to, it's, it's hard to take a case to court and to get a conviction. So um, what we know from overseas examples, like with Madoff, whistleblowers are very important to help uh, get the government to understand what's really going on. So when you have a, a, a no further action rate on whistleblower disclosures on average of 91%, that says to me that ASIC is not serious because surely, you know, a, a number of these whistleblowers have something important to say. And obviously we have someone on national TV saying, saying not only did I have something important to say, I had all the evidence to put the criminals behind bars and ASIC didn't even give me a phone call or return uh, an email 
um, and 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 that that's just systemic failure, and 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 I don't want to ever see that again in this country. No, well, that's absolutely right. Uh, we need a different way of thinking about it, and uh, you know, maybe sometimes the problem with ASIC is they're thinking almost too narrowly legalistically, right? But and there has to be proof, obviously, to be able to take them to court and stuff. But but if l rules are being broken and nobody is actually taking those breaks seriously, then we have a big, big problem in the country. Y yes, but but Martin, even if uh, ASIC takes a narrow legalistic interpretation, um, you don't know whether the case, whether the case can progress to court or not until you investigate. Yep, good point. So yep. so, so yes, yeah, so yep. the, the whole purpose of investigation is to. Uh, is to assess what evidence is there, the quality of the evidence, and whether a case can be brought. So, so I think if 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 this inquiry proves to show, if we get an inquiry, if it proves to show that ASIC is making uh, pre-investigation assumptions, and those assumptions are leading to uh, certain cases not to be investigated, I think I think that whole practice needs to be brought to a stop, and people need to say, well. Don't assume what the evidence is until you get out there and actually start to dig up. Because in my case, I get told of a wild conspiracy theory and until I went hunting, I started to find that the evidence started to line up. Um, and, and, and you don't know sometimes, particularly if it's a really wild allegation, you don't know where the case can go until you start um, going um, beneath the surface and finding out what what is that really out there. Yeah, very good point, John. So I guess the question now is, are there things that the audience on IOTP can do at this point? You know, what are the next steps and are there things that they could do? Yes, yes. So, so great point, Martin. So so what I need the audience to do now is, is that if you, well, two things. If you would like a copy of my report, um, email me at john at adamseconomics.com and we'll put that up on the screen for the audience to see. Um, happy to share the report and the press release that we've uh, issued to the media as well. Um, but then what we need our audience to do is to, if you have uh, a story or if you support the inquiry, it's to communicate just like we did on the cash ban, but to communicate to certain politicians who are sitting on some of these committees. So, Martin, if we put slide three on the screen, so we're going to show the committee members of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services. So these are the 10 members, five from the Senate, five from the House. Um, uh, if Now, my report is structured around this particular committee, but I have said in my report, if, if Parliament thinks that a better committee is suitable, then go to the other committee. But if everyone can focus on contacting these 10 people, that would be a very good important step and obviously particularly those individuals who have emailed me or emailed you over the last few weeks with their stories about ASIC if you can contact these 10 people by phone or by email and saying you have had a horror story with ASIC you want an inquiry I think that would be very powerful now but if we move on to slide four uh, the other important committee is the Senate Economics References Committee and there are six members on this committee uh, six senators three uh, from the coalition to Labour, one Green. Uh, again, if you email these six people and say uh, you would like an inquiry into ASIC, read the Adams report. It's really important stuff. I think I think that would be very powerful as well. And just if we can round out uh, the the conversation, if we go to slide five, Martin Eves is that. So we have the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Economics. Again, ten members of the House. Um, uh, a number of, uh, l in terms of Labour politicians, some coalition. We have one of the Teal Independents in terms of Allegra Spender. Um, she's also on the committee. If you email these 10 people um, and say you want an inquiry into ASIC and you expect Parliament to do its job in overseeing this financial regulator, I think that is important. Now, what I can say, again, just to confirm, I have written an official letter to each one of these parliamentarians with my report. Uh, basically outlining the, the key highlight themes, asking for an inquiry, asking for them to do their job, asking to engage with me if they wish. Um, and obviously some of these people I went and spoke to in early August. Some of these people have already made comments on the public record today in support of my report and of the inquiry. But the more stories they hear from financial victims, bank victims, etc., about how ASIC is not doing the job that the public expects. I think that's a powerful message, and hopefully that will mobilise these parliamentarians to 
uh, following my recommendation for an inquiry, uh, and, and, and part of the uh, report proposed a very comprehensive set of terms of reference. Um, uh, and I, we again, we're not leaving anything to chance with these people. We're just saying this is precisely what you need to look at. Uh, and now, uh, again, it's, it's Parliament's prerogative as to whether they accept my terms of reference or whether they want to change it around. But, but you know, obviously, we, we don't want to leave, leave anything to the imagination of uh, parliamentarians, given that I used to work in that building. And, <laughs> and so hopefully uh, this process will uh, uh, lead. Now, uh, what I will say, Martin, is, is that uh, Parliament is not back until the end of the month when the budget uh, will be announced by Treasurer Chalmers. So it, it could well be that uh, officially an inquiry can't be established until Parliament's back. But uh, if we can get enough uh, parliamentarians uh, focused on this issue over the next couple of weeks, hopefully we'll have some good news to report uh, by the end of the month. And just let me say two things. Firstly, if you want to find out specific email addresses and contact details for all of those parliamentarians, it's all on the website, the parliamentary website, isn't it? So it's quite easy to find. We'll, we'll put the link below so people can actually find that. The second is just to underscore, you know, the two themes. One is if people have had a specific bad experience with ASIC and, and, and they feel they've been let down. Yes. That's important. But secondly, also to endorse and, and support the view that ASIC does need to be looked at, alley or report. So those two sort of thematics need to come through. Absolutely, absolutely. And the other thing I would just say, Martin, is, is that if some of the people um, are a little bit confused about what the email addresses are, mm. um, because some of the politicians are not upfront with their email address, feel free for people to email me, email me, and I'll be able to provide all the email addresses to all of these people. Great. Well, well done, John. Congratulations. Another major step forward in the interest of the people. And I should be looking forward very much to what happens over the next few weeks. I think we've um, set another cat running out of the traps at the massive rate of knots. And the question is, where does that end up? We, we will see the answer to that question in the coming weeks, Martin. Well done, John. Thank you very much. Thank you. Martin North. John Adams in the interest of the people. We'll see you next time. 